Hi, Ruben here and welcome to Anatomy Movement, where anatomy becomes fun anatomy. We have summarized and detailed notes, acronyms, HD images to build your photographic memory, X-rays images, tabled notes and questions and answers at the end of each video to help you remember all that we have learned. Without further ado, let's dive into today's topic. Joints of the lower limb. A joint is a junction between two or more bones. Joints of the lower limb include hip joint, knee joint, ankle joint, tibiofibular joint, and the subtalar joint. The hip joint. The hip joint is a ball and socket synovial joint, formed by an articulation between the pelvic acetabulum and the head of the femur. It forms a connection from the lower limb to the pelvic girdle, and thus is designed for stability and weight bearing, rather than a large range of movement. In this video, we shall look at the anatomy of the hip joint, its articulating surfaces, ligaments and neurovascular supply. Structures of the hip joint. Articulating surfaces. The hip joint consists of an articulation between the head of femur and acetabulum of the pelvis. The acetabulum is a cup-like depression located on the inferolateral aspect of the pelvis. Its cavity is deepened by the presence of a fibrocartilaginous collar, the acetabular labrum. The head of femur is hemispherical, and fits completely into the concavity of the acetabulum. Both the acetabulum and head of femur are covered in articular cartilage, which is thicker at the places of weight bearing. The capsule of the hip joint attaches to the edge of the acetabulum proximally. Distally, it attaches to the intertrochanteric line anteriorly and the femoral neck posteriorly. Ligaments. The ligaments of the hip joint act to increase stability. They can be divided into two groups, intracapsular and extracapsular. Intracapsular. The only intracapsular ligament is the ligament of head of femur. It is a relatively small structure, which runs from the acetabular fossa to the fovea of the femur. It encloses a branch of the obturator artery, artery to head of femur, a minor source of arterial supply to the hip joint. Extracapsular. There are three main extracapsular ligaments, continuous with the outer surface of the hip joint capsule. Iliofemoral ligament, arises from the anterior inferior iliac spine and then bifurcates before inserting into the intertrochanteric line of the femur. It has a, Y, shaped appearance, and prevents hyperextension of the hip joint. It is the strongest of the three ligaments. Pubifemoral, spans between the superior pubic rami and the intertrochanteric line of the femur, reinforcing the capsule anteriorly and inferiorly. It has a triangular shape, and prevents excessive abduction and extension. Ischiofemoral spans between the body of the ischium and the greater trochanter of the femur, reinforcing the capsule posteriorly. It has a spiral orientation, and prevents hyperextension and holds the femoral head in the acetabulum. Neurovascular supply. The arterial supply to the hip joint is largely via the medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries, branches of the profunda femoris artery, deep femoral artery. They anastomose at the base of the femoral neck to form a ring, from which smaller arteries arise to supply the hip joint itself. The medial circumflex femoral artery is responsible for the majority of the arterial supply, the lateral circumflex femoral artery has to penetrate through the thick iliofemoral ligament. Damage to the medial circumflex femoral artery can result in avascular necrosis of the femoral head. The artery to head of femur and the superior inferior gluteal arteries provide some additional supply. The hip joint is innervated primarily by the sciatic, femoral and obturator nerves. These same nerves innervate the knee, which explains why pain can be referred to the knee from the hip and vice versa. Stabilizing factors. The primary function of the hip joint is to weight bear. There are a number of factors that act to increase stability of the joint. The first structure is the acetabulum. It is deep, and encompasses nearly all of the head of the femur. This decreases the probability of the head slipping out of the acetabulum dislocation. There is a horseshoe-shaped fibrocartilaginous ring around. The acetabulum which increases its depth, known as the acetabular labrum. The increase in depth provides a larger articular surface, further improving the stability of the joint. The iliofemoral, pub of amoral and ischiofemoral ligaments are very strong, and along with the thickened joint capsule, provide a large degree of stability. These ligaments have a unique spiral orientation, this causes them to become tighter when the joint is extended. 
In addition, the muscles and ligaments work in a reciprocal fashion at the hip joint. Anteriorly, where the ligaments are strongest, the medial flexors located anteriorly are fewer and weaker. Posteriorly, where the ligaments are weakest, the medial rotators are greater in number and stronger, they effectively pull the head of the femur into the acetabulum. Movements and muscles. The movements that can be carried out at the hip joint are listed below, along with the principal muscles responsible for each action. Flexion, iliopsoas, rectus femoris, sartorius, pectineus. Extension, gluteus maximus, semimembranosus, semitendinosus and biceps femoris the hamstrings. Abduction, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, piriformis and tensor fasci latae. Adduction, adductors longus, brevis and magnus, pectineus and gracilis. Lateral rotation, biceps femoris, gluteus maximus, piriformis, assisted by the obturators, gemelli and quadratus femoris. Medial rotation, anterior fibers of gluteus medius and minimus, tensor fasci latae. The degree to which flexion at the hip can occur depends on whether the knee is flexed. This relaxes the hamstring muscles and increases the range of flexion. Extension at the hip joint is limited by the joint capsule and the iliofemoral ligament. These structures become taut during extension to limit further movement. Clinical relevance. Dislocation of the hip joint. Congenital dislocation. Congenital hip dislocation occurs as a result of developmental dysplasia of the hip DDH. It occurs when the acetabulum is shallow as a result of failure to develop properly in utero. Common clinical features include limited abduction at the hip joint, limb length discrepancy, the affected limb is shorter, asymmetrical gluteal or thigh skin folds. DDH is usually treated with a pavlic harness. This holds the femoral head in the acetabular fossa and promotes normal development of the hip joint. Surgery is indicated in cases that do not respond to harness treatment. Acquired dislocation. Acquired dislocations of the hip joint are relatively uncommon, owing to the strength and stability of the joint. They usually occur as a result of trauma, but it can occur as a complication following total hip replacement or hemiarthroplasty. There are two main types of acquired hip dislocation, posterior and anterior. Posterior dislocation 90% The femoral head is forced posteriorly and tears through the inferior and posterior part of the joint capsule, where it is at its weakest. The affected limb becomes shortened and medially rotated. The sciatic nerve runs posteriorly to the hip joint, and is at risk of injury occurs in 10-20% of cases. This is often associated with anterior femoral head and posterior wall fractures. Anterior dislocation rare occurs as a consequence of traumatic extension, abduction and lateral rotation. The femoral head is displaced anteriorly and usually inferiorly in relation to the acetabulum. Now let's have a quiz. 1. Which of the following options correctly describes the acetabular labrum? Hyaline cartilage that covers the articular surface of the acetabulum. Fibrocartilaginous collar that surrounds the acetabulum. Ligament that extends from the acetabulum to the head of femur. Y-shaped cartilage located within the acetabulum prior to fusion. The correct answer is fibrocartilaginous collar that surrounds the acetabulum. 2. Which of the following best describes the action of piriformis on the hip joint? Medial rotation and flexion. Lateral rotation and adduction. Lateral rotation and abduction. Medial rotation and abduction. The correct answer is lateral rotation and abduction. The knee joint. The knee joint is a hinge-type synovial joint, which mainly allows for flexion and extension and a small degree of medial and lateral rotation. It is formed by articulations between the patella, femur and tibia. Articulating surfaces. The knee joint consists of two articulations, tibiofemoral and patellofemoral. The joint surfaces are lined with hyaline cartilage and are enclosed within a single joint cavity. Tibiofemoral, medial and lateral condyles of the femur articulate with the tibial condyles. It is the weight-bearing component of the knee joint. Patellofemoral, anterior aspect of the distal femur articulates with the patella. It allows the tendon of the quadriceps femoris knee extensor to be inserted directly over the knee, increasing the efficiency of the muscle. As the patella is both formed and resides within the quadriceps femoris tendon, it provides a fulcrum to increase power of the knee extensor and serves as a stabilizing structure that reduces frictional forces placed on femoral condyles. In this video, we shall examine the anatomy of the knee joint, 
its articulating surfaces, ligaments and neurovascular supply. Neurovascular supply. The blood supply to the knee joint is through the genicular anastomoses around the knee, which are supplied by the genicular branches of the femoral and popliteal arteries. The nerve supply, according to Hilton's law, is by the nerves which supply the muscles which cross the joint. These are the femoral, tibial and common fibular nerves. Manishi. The medial and lateral manishi are fibrocartilage structures in the knee that serve two functions. To deepen the articular surface of the tibia, thus increasing stability of the joint. To act as shock absorbers by increasing surface area to further dissipate forces. They are C-shaped and attached at both ends to the intercondylar area of the tibia. In addition to the intercondylar attachment, the medial meniscus is fixed to the tibial collateral ligament and the joint capsule. Damage to the tibial collateral ligament usually results in a medial meniscal tear. The lateral meniscus is smaller and does not have any extra attachments, rendering it fairly mobile. Bursae. A bursa is synovial fluid-filled sac, found between moving structures in a joint, with the aim of reducing wear and tear on those structures. There are four bursae found in the knee joint. Suprapatellar bursa, an extension of the synovial cavity of the knee, located between the quadriceps femoris and the femur. Prepatellar bursa, found between the apex of the patella and the skin. Infrapatellar bursa, split into deep and superficial. The deep bursa lies between the tibia and the patella ligament. The superficial lies between the patella ligament and the skin. Semimembranosus bursa, located posteriorly in the knee joint, between the semimembranosus muscle and the medial head of the gastrocnemius. Ligaments. The major ligaments in the knee joint are patellar ligament, a continuation of the quadriceps femoris tendon distal to the patella. It attaches to the tibial tuberosity. Collateral ligaments, two strap-like ligaments. They act to stabilize the hinge motion of the knee, preventing excessive medial or lateral movement. Tibial medial collateral ligament, white and flat ligament, found on the medial side of the joint. Proximally, it attaches to the medial epicondyle of the femur, distally it attaches to the medial condyle of the tibia. Fibular lateral collateral ligament, thinner and rounder than the tibial collateral, this attaches proximally to the lateral epicondyle of the femur, distally it attaches to a depression on the lateral surface of the fibular head. Cruciate ligaments, these two ligaments connect the femur and the tibia. In doing so, they cross each other, hence the term, cruciate, Latin for like a cross. Anterior cruciate ligament, attaches at the anterior intercondylar region of the tibia where it blends with the medial meniscus. It ascends posteriorly to attach to the femur in the intercondylar fossa. It prevents anterior dislocation of the tibia onto the femur. Posterior cruciate ligament, attaches at the posterior intercondylar region of the tibia and ascends anteriorly to attach to the anteromedial femoral condyle. It prevents posterior dislocation of the tibia onto the femur. Movements. There are four main movements that the knee joint permits. Extension. Produced by the quadriceps femoris, which inserts into the tibial tuberosity. Flexion. Produced by the hamstrings, gracilis, sartorius and popliteus. Lateral rotation. Produced by the biceps femoris. Medial rotation. Produced by five muscles, semimembranosus, semitendinosus, gracilis, sartorius and popliteus. NB. Lateral and medial rotation can only occur when the knee is flexed, if the knee is not flexed, the medial lateral rotation occurs at the hip joint. Clinical relevance. Injury to the knee joint. Collateral ligaments. Injury to the collateral ligaments is the most common pathology affecting the knee joint. It is caused by a force being applied to the side of the knee when the foot is placed on the ground. Damage to the collateral ligaments can be assessed by asking the patient to medially rotate and laterally rotate the leg. Pain on medial rotation indicates damage to the medial ligament, pain on lateral rotation indicates damage to the lateral ligament. If the medial collateral ligament is damaged, it is more than likely that the medial meniscus is torn, due to their attachment. Cruciate ligaments. The anterior cruciate ligament, ACL, can be torn by hyperextension of the knee joint, or by the application of a large force to the back of the knee with the joint partly flexed. To test for this, you can perform an anterior drawer test, where you attempt to pull the tibia forwards, if it moves, the ligament has been torn. The most common mechanism of posterior cruciate ligament, PCL, damage is the, dashboard injury. 
This occurs when the knee is flexed, and a large force is applied to the shins, pushing the tibia posteriorly. This is often seen in car accidents, where the knee hits the dashboard. The posterior cruciate ligament can also be torn by hyperextension of the knee joint, or by damage to the upper part of the tibial tuberosity. To test for PCL damage, perform the posterior draw test. This is where the clinician holds the knee in flexed position, and pushes the tibia posteriorly. If there is movement, the ligament has been torn. Bursitis. Friction between the skin and the patella cause the prepatellar bursa to become inflamed, producing a swelling on the anterior side of the knee. This is known as housemaid's knee. Similarly, friction between the skin and tibia can cause the infrapatellar bursae to become inflamed, resulting in what is known as clergyman's knee classically caused by clergyman kneeling on hard surfaces during prayer. Unhappy triad blown knee. As the medial collateral ligament is attached to the medial meniscus, damage to either can affect both structures' functions. A lateral force to an extended knee, such as a rugby tackle, can rupture the medial collateral ligament, damaging the medial meniscus in the process. The ACL is also affected, which completes the unhappy triad. Now let's have a quiz. 1. Which of the following is the correct classification of the knee joint? Hinge type synovial, plane type synovial, pivot type synovial, ball and socket. The correct answer is hinge type synovial. 2. Which type of cartilage are the knee manishi comprised of? Elastic, fibroelastic, hyaline, fibrocartilage. The correct answer is fibrocartilage. The ankle joint. The ankle joint or talocrural joint is a synovial joint located in the lower limb. It is formed by the bones of the leg tibia and fibula and the foot talus. Functionally, it is a hinge type joint, permitting dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the foot. In this video, we shall look at the anatomy of the ankle joint its articulating surfaces, ligaments, movements, and clinical correlations. Articulating surfaces. The ankle joint is formed by three bones, the tibia and fibula of the leg, and the talus of the foot. The tibia and fibula are bound together by strong tibiofibular ligaments. Together, they form a bracket-shaped socket, covered in hyaline cartilage. This socket is known as a mortise. The body of the talus fits snugly into the mortise formed by the bones of the leg. The articulating part of the talus is wedge-shaped, it is broad anteriorly, and narrow posteriorly. Dorsiflexion, the anterior part of the talus is held in the mortise, and the joint is more stable. Plantar flexion, the posterior part of the talus is held in the mortise, and the joint is less stable. Ligaments, there are two main sets of ligaments, which originate from each malleolus. Medial ligament. The medial ligament, or deltoid ligament, is attached to the medial malleolus, a bony prominence projecting from the medial aspect of the distal tibia. It consists of four ligaments, which fan out from the malleolus, attaching to the talus, calcaneus and navicular bones. The primary action of the medial ligament is to resist over aversion of the foot. Lateral ligament. The lateral ligament originates from the lateral malleolus, a bony prominence projecting from the lateral aspect of the distal fibula. It resists over inversion of the foot, and is comprised of three distinct and separate ligaments. Anterior talofibular, spans between the lateral malleolus and lateral aspect of the talus. Posterior talofibular, spans between the lateral malleolus and the posterior aspect of the talus. Calcaneofibular, spans between the lateral malleolus and the calcaneus. Clinical relevance, the ankle, ring. The ankle joint and associated ligaments can be visualized as a ring in the coronal plane. The upper part of the ring is formed by the articular surfaces of the tibia and fibula. The lower part of the ring is formed by the subtalar joint between the talus and the calcaneus. The sides of the ring are formed by the medial and lateral ligaments. A ring, when broken, usually breaks in two places. The best way of illustrating this is with a polo mint. It is very difficult to break one side without breaking the other. When dealing with an injury to the ankle joint, a clinician must bear this in mind. For example, a fracture of the ankle joint may occur in association with ligament damage which would not be apparent on x-ray. Movements and muscles involved. The ankle joint is a hinge-type joint, with movement permitted in one plane. Thus, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion are the main movements that occur at the ankle joint. Aversion and inversion are produced at the other joints of the foot, such as the subtalar joint. Plantar flexion, 
produced by the muscles in the posterior compartment of the leg gastrocnemius, soleus, plantaris and posterior tibialis. Dorsiflexion, produced by the muscles in the anterior compartment of the leg tibialis anterior, extensor hallucis longus and extensor digitorum longus. Neurovascular supply. The arterial supply to the ankle joint is derived from the malleolar branches of the anterior tibial, posterior tibial and fibular arteries. Innervation is provided by tibial, superficial fibular and deep fibular nerves. Clinical relevance, ankle sprain. An ankle sprain refers to partial or complete tears in the ligaments of the ankle joint. It usually occurs via excessive inversion to a plantar flexed and weight-bearing foot. The lateral ligament is more likely to be damaged for two main reasons. The lateral ligament is weaker than the medial ligament. The lateral ligament resists inversion. The anterior talofibular ligament is the lateral ligament most at risk of irreversible damage. Clinical relevance, POTS fracture dislocation. A POTS fracture is a term used to describe a bimalleolar medial and lateral malleoli, or tremaleolar medial and lateral malleoli, and distal tibia fracture. This type of injury is produced by forced aversion of the foot. It occurs in a series of stages. Forced aversion pulls on the medial ligaments, producing an avulsion fracture of the medial malleolus. The talus moves laterally, breaking off the lateral malleolus. The tibia is then forced anteriorly, shearing off the distal and posterior part against the talus. Now let's have a quiz. 1. Which type of synovial joint is the ankle? Bicondylar. Plane. Hinge. Saddle. The correct answer is. Hinge. 2. Below is an illustration of the ankle joint. Which label corresponds to the anterior talofibular ligament? A. B. Circa D. The correct answer is C. The subtalar joints. The subtalar joint is an articulation between two of the tarsal bones in the foot, the talus and calcaneus. The joint is classed structurally as a synovial joint, and functionally as a plain synovial joint. This video will look at the anatomy of the subtalar joint, its articulating surfaces, movements and neurovascular supply. Articulating surfaces. The subtalar joint is formed between two of the tarsal bones. Inferior surface of the body of the talus, the posterior talar articular surface. Superior surface of the calcaneus, the posterior calcaneal articular facet. As is typical for a synovial joint, these surfaces are covered by articular cartilage. Note. Some texts will refer to the talocalcaneal part of the talocalcaneonavicular joint as being part of the subtalar joint. Although this forms part of the functional joint, the true anatomical subtalar joint consists only of the surfaces mentioned above. Stability. The subtalar joint is enclosed by a joint capsule, which is lined internally by synovial membrane and strengthened externally by a fibrous layer. The capsule is also supported by three ligaments. Posterior talocalcaneal ligament medial talocalcaneal ligament, lateral talocalcaneal ligament, an additional ligament, the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament, acts to bind the talus and calcaneus together. It lies within the sinus tarsi, a small cavity between the talus and calcaneus, and is particularly strong, providing the majority of the ligamentous stability to the joint. Movements. The subtalar joint is formed on an oblique axis and is therefore the chief site within the foot for generation of aversion and inversion movements. This movement is produced by the muscles of the lateral compartment of the leg, and tibialis anterior muscle respectively. The nature of the articulating surface means that the subtalar joint has no role in plantar or dorsiflexion of the foot. Neurovascular supply. The subtalar joint receives supply from two arteries and two nerves. Arterial supply comes from the posterior tibial and fibular arteries. Innervation to the plantar aspect of the joint is supplied by the medial or lateral plantar nerve whereas the dorsal aspect of the joint is supplied by the deep fibular nerve. Clinical relevance. Calcaneal fracture. The calcaneus is often fractured in a crush type injury. The most common mechanism of damage is falling onto the heel from a height. The talus is driven into the calcaneus. The bone can break into several pieces, known as a comminuted fracture. Upon X-ray imaging, the calcaneus will appear shorter and wider. A calcaneal fracture can cause chronic problems, even after treatment. The subtalar joint is usually disrupted, causing the joint to become arthritic. The patient will experience pain upon inversion and aversion, which can make walking on uneven ground particularly painful.
Now let's have a quiz. 1. What two tarsal bones contribute articular surfaces to the anatomical subtalar joint? Talus and navicular. Navicular and calcaneus. Talus and calcaneus. Talus and cuboid. The correct answer is. Talus and calcaneus. 2. Which movement is possible at the subtalar joint? Inversion. Dorsiflexion. Plantar flexion. Rotation. The correct answer is. Inversion. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe to Anatomy Movement channel for more.